Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. The digital universe is exploding and it's having an impact on the data center and certainly on storage and storage protocols. And as a result, uh, IT managers and IT planners are being flooded with different options. To help us with that conversation, I've asked Nitin Garg from Cisco to uh, kind of walk us through some of the options. Hi, Nitin. Hi, George. How are you? I'm doing great. Well, first, before we jump into this, tell me a little bit about what you do at Cisco. So, I lead product management for storage networking on MDS and Nexus families, so 2K through 7K. Okay. And I'm representing the data center portfolio from a storage networking perspective. Okay, and I, I think that you know Cisco certainly is a household name in the data center, um, but in storage, uh, I think that it might be helpful to tell people what, kind of what you guys do from a storage networking perspective. Right, and George, actually there's many different options that customers can use to deploy storage networking. Cisco is focused on a holistic approach to enabling customers to do storage networking regardless of which product portfolio they're using. Okay, that's great. So let's kind of get back to the subject at hand then. So, you know, as we said in the opening, just digital, the digital universe is exploding, data, uh, more criticality, just a lot of different aspects here, and it's impacting the storage environment, right? So why don't, I know you got some stuff written up here. Why don't we walk through some of the different options that are available and to kind of help people make some decisions? As you mentioned, storage is exploding. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the analysts are saying or forecasting data doubling every two years, you know, 10x growth by 2020. So, what does that mean for storage networking? What we see are three different types of architectures that are happening. You know, one is your classical architecture, which is where fiber channel dominates, and you know, you would run applications such as um, such as database exchange and so on. Then there's your big data. NAS kind of applications. So large unstructured type of data. Large growth. unstructured, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is cloud storage, where customers may be doing replication in the cloud or mobility and so on. So, you know, cloud storage. So these are the three different types of applications. Now, when customers are making their decisions and they're doing refreshes, mm -hmm. well, they have to make their decision over five, seven, ten years. Right. So what is it that they need to look out for? There are cer cer several things that they should watch out for. Okay. Number one, they should be looking at multi-protocol flexibility, right? So they don't know which protocols they'll be deploying. They want to make sure that when they're deploying that they are covered. So basically that's if I want to maybe deploy fiber channel today, I still want the option to maybe go one of the Ethernet protocols maybe in the future. So I don't want to be locked into a single source. Exactly. Okay. Multi-protocol, multi-architecture, and so on. Okay. Then Performance. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're covered from a performance perspective. Doesn't matter whether it's fiber channel, Ethernet, 16 gig fiber channel, next generation protocol for fiber channel, 10 gigabit Ethernet, 40 gigabit Ethernet, and so on. Okay. And then scale. So it's not just about speeds and feeds, it's about control plane scalability, deploying, you know, lots, thousands of devices, virtual, physical, and so on. So you want to make sure that that your options are not tied and you've got these different things covered. So, and is part of scale the ability to manage that scale as well? Exactly, good point. So, definitely management is very important because the number of people who are managing the data center is not really increasing while all of this is changing. So, management and reducing operational simplicity is key. Okay. Now, as we look at these different types of architectures, I'll go through each one of these different applications okay. and talk about you know, what are the customers deploying in their data centers? Okay. So here is a classical architecture that we're all very familiar with. So here you've got the Ethernet and the fiber channel. Mm -hmm. So separate fiber channel and Ethernet networks. You've got host. So let's look at the fiber channel, host. And you've got switches and switches. So edge, core, and connected to the storage. Sure. Right. And then you have got the Ethernet um, network as well. Right. Now, you know, there are a lot of advantages to deploying this type of architectures. Number one, customers are very used to it. They know it works. You know, keep the two networks separate. The organizations may be different. Mm -hmm. So if a lot of customers who are deploying this, as they're deploying it, they want to make sure that as they're deploying these type of architectures for Fiber Channel, they are taking care of these different types of requirements. Okay. So this would work well in an environment where you've got different teams for, for different purposes, like maybe a network team and a storage team, things like that? Right, right. Okay. Now, when I talk to a lot of customers, they are deploying this today 
but then they're thinking maybe I want to do convergence over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. In the future, you know, I don't want to tie my options down. Right. So for those type of customers, you know, those customers that are deploying Fiber Channel today and they have Ethernet, mm -hmm. and then they're looking to see how can I mix and match, how can I do convergence. You know, when you do convergence over Ethernet, there's certain advantages that come with that. Sure. So the advantages could be you can re you're reducing the number of adapters that you have in the host versus having two NIC and two HBA. You're reducing the number of adapters. Right. You're reducing the number of switch ports. If you're, let's say, doing your LAN and SAN over the same switch, you're reducing the number of switch ports, mm -hmm. number of switches, and you're reducing the amount of cabling that you have. Right. Right. So for those customers that, let's say, want to do the convergence, they could do the convergence here, and then they could basically go to the core. So they could have a SAN A, SAN B architecture. Mm -hmm. They could do the convergence here. They could be running your Ethernet VPC, and they could be doing the convergence. So they could keep their kind of legacy back end, if you will, right. and just but converge here. That's still going to eliminate a lot of redundancy, right? Right. And so a lot of customers are actually you know, thinking of doing this in the future. And in fact, a lot of customers have deployed convergence at the access layer. So you know, UCS has convergence built into it. So FCOE running in, inside it. Mm -hmm. A lot of customers doing it at the access layer, and then they may be splitting out fiber channel and going to a fiber channel core. Okay. There are quite a few customers who are looking at doing multi-hop FCOE as well. So going through this, and then aggregating their FCOE, and right. creating dense storage cores with fiber channel and FCOE storage. So doing end-to-end -end FCOE as well. Okay. So just to make sure we're all on the same page on terms, fiber, uh, FCOE, fiber channel over Ethernet. That is right. Okay. Right. And, and, and I, so the big gain here is, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because when people say, well, you could reduce cabling, I think a lot of people, ah, cabling. But wow, the cabling part is it could be a pretty big deal, not only just in the physical purchase of the cable, but just the amount of space and the heat it generates as well, right? Right. There's, I think I saw something from you guys where there's a big power and cooling reduction just in getting rid of some of that cabling, right? Right. So, you know, we have a multi-hop FCOE case study mm -hmm. at Cisco.com with Boeing, where Boeing did multi-hop FCOE. They, they tested the first hop FCOE, liked it so much, did multi-hop FCOE. And what they found when they did end-to-end -end multi-hop FCOE is that they uh, reduced provisioning time of the servers by 25% mm -hmm. because now they only had to deploy a server with one time connected to the network. Right. And in the back end, they can connect to any type of storage. Right. They reduced cabling by 35%, and then they reduced the cooling requirements by about 90% because the amount of switches and sold sure. different elements that they were able to reduce. Right. Okay. So, so big advantages. Uh, if and, and you know one key thing here is that the teams have to work together. So this is something that could develop over time. Okay. So that's your classical architecture. Okay. Now, for those customers that are looking to deploy big data, scale out, NAS, and cloud kind of environments, they're looking at Ethernet fabrics. Okay. And the advantage of Ethernet fabrics is that you can deploy a, a leaf spine type of architecture okay. where you've got 10 gigabit Ethernet running to the host, and you've got 40 gigabit Ethernet within the fabric. Okay. And there's no spanning tree protocol. So you've got multi-path uh, going on within the fabric and very high speed uh, fabric. So all these links are active in that environment. Then. Exactly. Okay. And so the question the customers ask is, let's say if I'm deploying my big data scale out NAS over such a Ethernet fabric with multi-pathing, how do I deploy my classical fiber channel or FCOE storage with this? It's a pretty good, pretty good question. Right. Yeah. And, and so what we're doing is we are enabling at Cisco connection of, uh, of fiber channel and FCOE to such a fabric. Okay. So that's something to, to watch out for. Okay. Okay, good. Now, so these are the, the different types of architectures that customers can look at. Now, the, the thing is, we talked about operational simplicity. So, so management. What are the things to watch out for as you're, as you're managing these different types of architectures? Mm -hmm. Some of the key things to watch out for are end-to-end -end visibility. So, you know, management, you want to watch out for end-to-end -end visibility. Yeah, we talk about that a lot, especially as we start to abstract the, the server and we get into virtual machines, is understanding what the performance is all the way through to that virtual machine becomes really important. Exactly. So you want to tie in to the vCenter, get the information that the, that the virtual machine administrator is seeing to the storage admin. Mm -hmm. You want to get the information from the compute side. You want to get the information from the SAN, from the LAN, 
And also from the storage array, so the storage admin can make decisions in a single pane of glass. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. And then once you can do that, you can take advantages of and, and do certain analytics such as you know, host path redundancy, where you can decide in an automated manner whether every host is dual path connected or not. That can save you a lot of time. And this end, what I also find with this end-to-end -end visibility is it also gives us, uh, it gives the application owners more comfort when we tell them that we're going to really increase virtual machine density and really start stacking things. Because now I can go in and start to really guarantee certain levels of performance, right? Exactly. Yeah. And make it easier to troubleshoot and decide where to put data stores as you're firing up new applications and do that in a very quick manner. So th this is a good overview of where we are. So what is Cisco doing to kind of fit into this model? OK, very good. Thank you for asking, George. So what we have done right now is we're actually introducing uh, 9148S, which is a 16 gig 48 port line rate 1RU fabric switch. Okay. We're also introducing 9706, which is a six slot chassis for the 9700 series falling on to 9710. And we're also introducing a 48 port FCOE module, which can go into the 9706 or the 9710. Okay. Now, with this type of architectures, customers can fit it into here and also do FCOE with the Nexus portfolio and also with, let's say, UCSFI on the, on the compute side and have a seamless, uh, with no interop required, kind of an architecture. And that and gives them some flexibility to, to move to, the, you know, you had said earlier, kind of go you know, converge at your pace, right? Yeah. And this really gives them a, the ability to really do that, right? Converge at the rate at the rate they're ready to do it. Right. Okay. And then for for this thing, we're introducing dynamic FCOE using Fabric Path. We have also really focused on improving scale, and we are also focused on management. So end-to-end -end visibility, switch health scores. So every switch has a score associated with it that you can can look at, uh, uh, automated handling of congestion, and so on. Yeah, I remember one of the things that you had talked about is the ability to uh, identify and address slow drain devices, for example, right? Exactly, yeah. which is a big focus area for us, doing it in an automated manner to first identify and then to recover the network from such devices. Right, because when you get into this type of architecture, expecting the human, if you will, to pinpoint every single one of these components is almost unrealistic, isn't it? Exactly, as the architectures are getting bigger and bigger, you know, that can have an effect. Okay. Well, thanks very much for joining us today. It's a great overview, I think, and uh, I think gives people a really good path of sort of how to manage these issues. Thank you so much for your time, George. Right, thank you. I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us today.